Welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and cockles presented by Bolin Media. I am your host, Ross Bolin, and today it is just me. Why, you might ask? Because Barrett got 20 minutes into the Lord, or the Rings of Power, as it were, and uh, said, nah, son, this isn't for me. And that's fine. That's fine. One of the first things I have to say about this show is that, like all fantasy stuff, it's not everyone's cup of tea. That being said, for those of us whose childhood was shaped by the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, for those of you who grew up on J.R.R. Tolkien's literary works, I would say this show is safely considered a must-watch. I'm going to start today by discussing the main characters in Season 1 of The Rings of Power and giving a little background on their role in this whole story as it pertains to Season 1. So the spoilers are starting now, and if you have not watched Season 1 of The Rings of Power and wish to do so with no information at all, you need to bounce. Alright? Get going. Our story takes place some 3,000 years before the events of The Hobbit when Bilbo Baggins stole the ring from Gollum. Essentially, we are dealing with three groups of characters in The Rings of Power Season 1, and obviously their stories will all intertwine in one way or another before it's all said and done, uh, which uh, begins over the course of these first eight episodes. First off... We've got the elves and the elf side of the story. The show opens, actually, introducing us to Galadriel, played by Morphid Clark, who functions as one of the main characters, if not the main character, throughout the first season. And of course, we know Galadriel from the Lord of the Rings trilogy as well, so we know she survives this whole mess, right? It's one of the strange elements of watching a prequel some of the characters overlap, therefore we don't have to worry about their deaths. Um, if you're like, wait, who was Galadriel in Lord of the Rings? Kate Blanchett played Galadriel in LOTR. Now, in this series, Galadriel's character does not believe that the evil that was Morgoth has been defeated. Morgoth is not someone or something I was familiar with before watching this show, but to give a simple explanation, Morgoth was basically a fallen god that became the Dark Lord during the First Age and sought out to conquer all of Middle-earth, creating all manner of monsters to form a powerful army and corrupting every being he came across, bringing them under his control. In this story, he is responsible for all evil that exists in Middle-earth, all the bad shit originates from Morgoth's existence, and his name is mentioned repeatedly, especially in the first few episodes as we're setting all of this stuff up. Now, Sauron, who we know from the Lord of the Rings, the Great Eye, wreathed in flame, is the greatest of Morgoth's named servants. Okay, so it was one of the things I struggled with during, during episode one of The Rings of Power. I was like, who? Morgoth? What the, I don't remember hearing anything about a Morgoth. What happened to Sauron? Um, so basically, to get a little further into Galadriel, we are told her brother died in his quest to rid the earth of Morgoth and his evil. And Galadriel wants to complete that mission for him. And the elven elders are like, nah, you're going to elf heaven. And she's like, nah, I'm staying here because I know I'm right, and the evil lives on, so I must fight it. As anyone with even a small bit of wits within them would guess, Galadriel is correct, and there is much more evil that is still out there to be dealt with. Hence, this entire series, The Rings of Power. We're also introduced to Elrond in Episode 1, played by Robert Arameo, another character we are familiar with from the original trilogy of LOTR, uh, where he was played by... Hugo Weaving, who you likely know as Agent Smith from The Matrix. In this season, Elrond ends up being an apprentice or assistant of sorts to another elf named Celebrimor. And Celebrimor is played by Charles Edwards. He's the most famous jewel smith of his time with a pretty complicated family history if you look into it. And it's mentioned sort of 
sparsely throughout this first season. It's not getting any simpler in this season because he's creating rings, which having seen Lord of the Rings, having read the title of this series, and having watched the first season, I do not think will end well. Then you've got Gil Gallad, played by Benjamin Walker. And if I mispronounce any of these names on any level, I do not apologize. They're all absurd fantasy names and, and all manner of different races and fantastical beings mixed in. I, it's difficult, all right? It's challenging. Give me a break. Um, but Gil Gallad is the king of the elves, who I am personally guessing is going to end up being a ring wraith before this show is over based on his stature and generally off-putting demeanor. <laughs> the ring wraiths are those dark riders in the Lord of the Rings trilogy who are constantly shrieking and they make the Fellowship of the Ring difficult to fall asleep to um, because I've tried many, many times and every time these freaking ring wraiths shriek, it, it wakes me up. Very unpleasant noises. But I'm just guessing, by the way, on what happens to Gil Gallad. I, his name and face annoy me. One of our new characters, and one of several characters of color in this series who spawned all manner of racist nonsense online, Erendir, 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 right? Yeah? Erendir is played by Ishmael Cruz Cordova. Erendir and a battalion of elves watch over the humans that reside peacefully in the Southlands. All right? And the Southlands are important. If you've watched the entirety of season one, which you probably should have if you're listening to this podcast, um, they obviously play a huge role in the, re in the whole story. Uh, but apparently the humans in the Southlands, at least a, a, a lot of them, were loyal to Morgoth. And they aided him in his quest to conquer Middle-earth. So Erendir and these other elves in his battalion are sort of just patrolling those lands, making sure that some other uprising doesn't occur basically keeping the evil at bay, keeping a watchful eye on these humans that have questionable uh, pasts, as it were. And that basically covers the elf side of the story. Although both the human and the dwarf groups in our story intertwine with the elves over the course of season one, so let's just do dwarfs next. One of, if not the favorite character of season one for me, is Durin the Fourth, played by Owain Arthur. Now, Durin's father is the king of the dwarves, uh, King Durin III, who currently rules over the dwarf kingdom of Khazad Doom, where Gandalf yells, You shall not pass in the Fellowship of the Ring, otherwise referred to as the Mines of Moria in that film. So, one of my favorite things about watching The Rings of Power, obviously, was being able to connect the things that I already knew about like, I knew about the Mines of Moria. We spent a good chunk of time there during the Fellowship of the Ring. It's one of the coolest parts of that movie. One of the most memorable lines from Gandalf in the entire uh, opening trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. And, uh, yeah, it turns out that's actually Casa Doom, this dwarf kingdom of which King Durin III is currently king, ruling over it. And his son, Durin IV, is is probably my favorite character from this first season, all things said and done. Uh, during the fourth is just one of the most entertaining characters so far in Rings of Power. He's married to Disa, D-I-S-A, played by Sofia Nomvede, a female dwarf who sings to the mountain, which is a thing that the dwarfs, that they do, is sing to the mountain. Um, it's another one of our characters of color, Disa, that the racist twats online were triggered by. And I just want to add, again, for good measure, if you're overly concerned with the skin color of characters in a fantasy TV show derived from fantasy novels, I implore you to attend therapy. I'm still in awe of the amount of back blow, blowback, <laughs> backlash <laughs> that this show received for including persons of color as characters. It's it, truly sickening and disturbing stuff. None of this is real. In the first place, all right? And, and racism, at its core, is perhaps the most nonsensical and lacking in common sense social structure that the humans IRL have ever concocted. Get your shit together, people. So that covers the dwarfs. So you really only need to know those two. I mean, there's, there's others, but those are the two most important. Um, then we come to the Harfoots, who are our hobbits in the Rings of Power. And it turns out, 
Harfoots are the most common race of hobbit. They're basically, the, the ones we deal with in this show are like the ancestors to the hobbits that we end up meeting in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. There are three different races of hobbit, which is yet another thing I did not know going into this series. Um, but one of the things I really enjoyed about watching The Rings of Power is that it forces you deeper into the world of J.R.R. Tolkien, what he created, and gives you a much more vast knowledge of the races and histories from his writings. I will say, though, the Harfoots were probably the most disappointing part of this first season for me. Like, I I can't help but compare them to the hobbits that we meet in The Fellowship of the Ring in the first film of the trilogy. And when you meet the hobbits and you, and you spend time in the Shire, you immediately love it, right? Everything about it. I mean, it just seems like the, the, the ideal community that you would want to be a part of, right? And uh, it just really brings you in into the story and Frodo obviously does a phenomenal job of helping with that and, and Samwise, but, and, and Mary and Pippin as well. And the whole birthday party for Bilbo's 111, 11th, 11th, however they say it, it's craziness, uh, for his birthday, like that whole scene, that whole setup, everything at the beginning of the fellowship of the ring makes you fall in love with the hobbits and become extremely invested in what occurs with, with Frodo and Sam and the rest of them throughout the course of that trilogy. And that is not, what happened with me and the Harfoots, okay? But there are essentially two Harfoots I would distinguish as the most important. First off, Eleanor Nori Brandyfoot, played by Markella Cavanaugh, who is our main Harfoot, right? She She's our main hobbit. Essentially our Frodo Baggins of this series, Nori. And then you've got Poppy Proudfellow, played by Megan Richards, who is essentially our Samwise Gamgee of this series. So... Super creative. Instead of Frodo and Sam, you've got Nori and Poppy. You see how they did that? Two female, two female leads for our, our hobbits this time. Crazy creativity. On the human side of the story, and by, by the way, the Harfoots, there's all manner of other Harfoots running around. You've got her mom, her dad. You've got some Harfoots of color that are upsetting the racists online as well. Um, a, a whole little community of these wandering Harfoots. They never stay in one place. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're nomads, as it were. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I had a difficult time connecting with them as much as I connected with the hobbits from the Shire, is that they don't have, like, a, a spot yet. They don't have a place in this world. They're just always on the move, uh, you know, foraging for food and, and hiding, as it were. So it's just, it's, it's interesting you know, they obviously couldn't just do the exact same thing with the Hobbits that they did in the trilogy and, and then, the, uh, then the prequel to that trilogy that they created. Um, but, the prequel films I'm speaking about, but the Hobbit trilogy, as it were. But, it just didn't hit for me the way I kind of hoped, like, I mean, I ended up seeing Galadriel, the elf, much more like my main character, my most important character, the character I was emotionally invested in by comparison you know, when it came to Nori and Poppy, I just didn't, it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't hit, hit the same, is the best way I know how to put it. Um, but yeah, on the human side of the story, this is where over the course of like episodes two and three, I was kind of like, wait, what? Who, 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 what? So you've got Queen Regent Muriel, played by Cynthia Adai Robinson, who rules over the island kingdom of Numenor. All right, Numenor was not something that I remembered from the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, but it is mentioned at one point. I think we actually sailed through Numenor. Um, if you uh, paid close enough attention to the Lord of the Rings, then you do remember Numenor, but I did not. But yeah, Queen Regent Muriel uh, is not a character that we get a whole lot of depth from in this first season, but she's there and she's part of the story, an important part of the story, and, and she's having, uh, you know bad nightmares based visions about the fall of Numenor and how she's going to bring it on and uh, and things don't go particularly well for her. But then we've got Elind Elendil? Elendil, played by Lloyd Owen. He is the guy whose name translates directly to elf friend. He's a human, but uh, the most important part of Elendil is that he is the father of Isildur, which is certainly a name you should remember from Lord of the Rings. So Isildur, played by Maxim Baldry, is Elendil's troublemaking son throughout much of season one, Elendil and his son, Asildor. And then there's 
Bronwyn, another human, played by Nazanin Boniati, mother of Theo Bronwyn. Um, Theo, by the way, just a fucking idiot. And Bronwyn lives in the same area that Arindor, Arindir, excuse me, the elf, is patrolling. I mentioned Arindir, the elf of color, who is with a whole battalion of elves who are overlooking the Southlands to make sure these people that were once loyal to Morgoth don't, like, do evil stuff again or whatever. And Bronwyn is his, like, his human girlfriend, Arendir's human girlfriend. They're in love, much like Aragorn and Arwen in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, Another parallel there. And again, Bronwyn's idiot son, Theo, is played by Tyro... Muhafidin, I believe it's pronounced, and he cannot stop doing dumb shit in this season. Theo was probably the most frustrating character out of all of them. If you weren't as frustrated by the Harfoots as I was, then certainly Theo was the most frustrating character for you to watch. He's just, like, everything he does, you're just like, oh, this isn't gonna end well. Oh, clearly he's doing dumb shit now. He's got the helm of Sauron's sword that he's like hiding from the orcs and you're just like why is this kid doing the things he is doing he is the main reason that you feel like there certainly is a reason the elves should be overlooking these humans in the southlands because there is evil afoot and they are not smart enough or good hearted enough to avoid it and then last but certainly not least we've got a human called Halbrand Halbrand whose name I bumped up against. I just don't, I don't know why, but I, I fucking hated his name. Hal Brand. He's played by Charlie Vickers, who from the get-go, I definitely sensed something was off about this dude. He did a really good job, Charlie Vickers, of playing Hal Brand in a way that let you know, like, mm, something isn't right, but not enough for it to, like, override his character so you could still get into this potential relationship building between him and Galadriel throughout the course of season one, which obviously ends in a way we'll discuss uh, later in the finale that that sort of throws you off. Or very much threw you off, depending on how well you were paying attention throughout the first seven episodes. Oh, and then there's a tall, gangly goofball known simply as The Stranger, who rides a goddamn comet down into the ground near the Harfoots uh, that then, you know, we've got... Uh, our two, our two main Harfoots, Nori and Poppy, end up interacting with the stranger, and that's like, I mean, look, the stranger maintains such a vague storyline throughout the first several, ep- four or five episodes, like really like, it's just sort of the same mysterious nonsense over and over where you're like, what is the deal with this guy? Who is this guy? What is happening with this guy? Why are these two Harfoots, Nori and Poppy, constantly screwing with this guy? And it, in the same way that, like, you know, if this wasn't a giveaway for you, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy and in the Hobbit trilogy, it is Gandalf whose presence sparks the entire adventure for Bilbo Baggins before him and then Frodo Baggins. And Gandalf's presence is the thing that gets these hobbits involved in the bigger picture story of Middle-earth and what is going to happen to Middle-earth. So when the stranger comes commenting in, like just from the get-go, you're based on his build, based on his appearance, based on his hair and facial hair, you're just kind of like, wait a minute, who is this guy? And uh, yeah, I mean, look, it he ends up being the catalyst for all the crazy things that happen with the Harfoots, who again are our hobbits in this series. So... Yeah, holy hell. That's like just the characters whose names you would have to remember coming out of season one. And there are so many characters to keep up with. This series certainly rivals Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon in that regard. But I just wanted to make sure we got a baseline of all of our characters that we met over the course of season one of The Rings of Power. And now we can talk about what unfolds in season one a little more specifically. But first, today's episode is brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN, here to drastically enhance your web browsing experience and data security. No one likes to be watched 
or tracked, even if they have nothing to hide. That's why it's important to step up your privacy game whenever possible. If you aren't using a VPN right now, you're currently open to having your internet data creeped on in a big way. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and is a service that protects your internet connection and privacy online. It creates an encrypted tunnel for your data, protects your online identity by hiding your IP address, allows you to use public Wi-Fi hotspots safely, and more. VPNs are the only way to be sure that your real location and IP address are hidden, your online data is encrypted, and your browsing history is invisible to your internet service provider and other third parties. Everyone who cares about their privacy should be using a VPN right now, and NordVPN is the best and fastest VPN provider in the business. NordVPN is software, not hardware. Super easy to use across every major platform, Windows, Android, iOS, macOS, Linux... And even your Android TV supports NordVPN. You can connect with just one click or enable auto-connect for zero-click protection. Personally, I love NordVPN because if you travel abroad, you finally get a vacation in or whatever, you can make sure you still have access to your favorite shows and movies from your home country on location-based streamers like Netflix or HBO Max using NordVPN. And because at this point, I think it's important we all take our own steps to protect our privacy online. So grab your exclusive Clam Fam NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash OCC to get a huge discount on your NordVPN plan, plus free threat protection, plus four months for free. This deal is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee, so you've got nothing to lose except the sense of insecurity. There's a link for the deal in the description of this episode. Thank you to NordVPN for supporting the Clam Fam and our online security. And again, that's NordVPN, N-O-R-D-V-P-N dot com slash O-C-C code O-C-C. So we had eight episodes, right, in the first season of the Rings of Power, which was created by J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay. I guess I should probably give credit to the showrunners and the directors that were involved, since we've talked about all the characters already, and their actors. J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay are the creators, and then there's three different directors at the helm over the course of this first installment of eight episodes. You've got J.A. Bayona, Wayne Che Yip, and Charlotte Bronstrom. All right, and the Rings of Power... The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power is the full title of the show, I suppose. It famously earned the title of the most expensive television show of all time between the price Amazon paid for the rights and the monstrous budget deployed to execute season one. I think they topped a billion dollars on those two things alone. So, do I think season one was worth the price tag? After episode one, I was honestly not all that intrigued. I actually watched the first episode, fell asleep toward the end, um, not necessarily as a result of it being super boring, but I was just very, very tired. And then I didn't come back and pick it up again for a few days. And when I did, again, I didn't make it all the way through, which at this point I did start to blame a little bit on the lack of excitement in the show. And it was like a full two weeks before I finally went back and I said, at that point I was like, I got to start this thing over. I started episode one over, I watched it from front to back and I went, okay, I'm, I'm invested. But this is one of the reasons that I can see why so many people like my co-host Barrett Dudley were not willing to ride with this series because it was going to be an eight hour time investment for something that frankly was a little bit slow out of the gate. And the first episode in particular felt a little discombobulated where you're just kind of like, wait, who, what, where, why, what is the, huh? It just took time to build momentum and sort of put the pieces in order on the board in a way that made sense to us as viewers so that you could really get excited about them. So again, it feels like unless you were really invested in the Lord of the Rings, in J.R.R. Tolkien's works, in the Hobbit trilogy and all of that, then this was kind of a tough sell. And I understand that. Um, I still think it was good, and I'll get to my overall rating in a minute, but the point is, it really did, not not, not necessarily stumble out of the gate, but it, it just kind of was lacking in the draw, like, it didn't pull me in the way I had hoped that it would, so... Because it was also running at the same, like, obviously it went up against House of the Dragon, something that I was fully invested in, committed to, and we were doing a companion podcast for week after week here on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. I was just kind of like, eh, I can deal with this later, right? So I was going to take on House of the Dragon first, and then I went back and ended up finishing The Rings of Power 
um, after House of the Dragon concluded. But yeah, even for the first episode, man, it took me like two weeks to finally get through the thing just because it sort of was a little bit slower than I had expected um, to start. So, I mean, it didn't really feel like they, they ca- like, I feel like they knew that, right? Maybe not Amazon, but the showrunners and the directors and whoever like wrote this episode after episode knew that it was going to be a slow build, that the way they were setting up the story, you were kind of going to have to be invested for the payoff longer term. And so they didn't just like do a whole bunch in episode one to try and pull people in who weren't already massively interested and invested in the Lord of the Rings brand and movies. But what I found over the course of the few weeks that I ended up watching the entire series is that it did indeed improve episode to episode. And like, so episode two was better than one. Episode three was better than uh, two. Episode four was better than three and so on and so forth. And the finale along with the big reveals and twists that it provided, definitely cemented The Rings of Power as a series I will be sticking with to the end, barring some massive blunder uh, somewhere along the way, which I'm not saying is all together out as a possibility, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be something that, much like House of the Dragon, the first season serves as a setup for everything that is to come. And the first season, as a result, does not end up being maybe the most mind-blowing thing you've ever seen. It's more just the setup for a longer, more drawn-out series that will unfold over the course of several different seasons, right? So you kind of have to understand that going in. And this is one of the issues with this age of prestige television that we are currently living in. Like, the bar is so high in so many different places and there are so many different options that people aren't as willing to invest their time and energy into shit that doesn't have immediate payoff. And this is in the age of immediate payoff and immediate instant gratification and satisfaction um, that we are living in. So on top of all that, you've also got this is like the best time to be alive as a TV viewer ever. And it made it, I think, more difficult for a lot of people to jump into something like the Rings of Power unless, again, you really, really already cared and were really, really invested in the Lord of the Rings as a franchise. Um, Before we discuss the reveals and twists that the finale provided, let me say, while I still don't think it's altogether fair to compare the Rings of Power with other great fantasy series of our time, mainly Game of Thrones or even its first spinoff, House of the Dragon... If you had to, like gun to your head, somebody said, what was better? You know, House of the Dragon season one or the Rings of Power season one? I I think you, the Rings of Power and Amazon inarguably fell short in their quest to unseat HBO and Game of Thrones as the premier fantasy program on television. It just didn't do enough in the first season. Um, and look, there's, it's a similar setup too, because if you consider the fact that the, the original trilogy, the original Lord of the Rings trilogy was pretty much across the board, both critically and from an audience standpoint, praised is it's considered classic cinema at this point. It has aged well. It's phenomenal. I watch them a few times a year. I'll watch the, the movies, the first three, but that Hobbit trilogy by and large was it didn't flop i think they made a bajillion dollars but from a storytelling and from a critical standpoint they weren't great and they do not hold up in the same way that the original trilogy does there's too much cgi it's too dependent on bullshit that you don't particularly care about and it just didn't work out so i say it's similar to the house of the dragon situation because game of thrones while the first six seasons are by and large considered six of the best to ever be on television by anybody who knows what they're talking about the last two fell flat on their face. And I don't think that the Hobbit trilogy fell as flat on its face as the final season and particularly the final episode of Game of Thrones did, but both franchises were in a position where if they really wanted to get a whole bunch of hype and pull all these people back in, they were going to have to kill it with the first season. And I just don't think the Rings of Power did as good of a job as House of the Dragon did to do that, to, 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 to make that point come back, it's worth it, we're we're killing this, it's going to be incredible, you're going to love the ride. House of the Dragon did a better job, in my opinion, to make that statement than the Rings of Power Season 1 did. 
Um, it just lack of gratuitous sex and violence aside, it simply didn't carry the same real world human elements and questions about morality and humanity on the whole that Thrones has been able to address through its first series and through the first season of its spinoff, House of the Dragon. So simply put, the Rings of Power was not that deep, right? It, it, was it fun? Absolutely. Uh, but mostly, again, because I'm a big LOTR fan who is giddy to learn more about Middle Earth, its peoples and its history and everything that led up to the trilogy that was a massively influential part of my childhood, that original Lord of the Rings trilogy. But if you were just a casual watching this series, I'm betting you didn't walk away all that impressed. And that's if you made it to the finale, where much of the payoff was delivered. So let's talk about that payoff. Through the first seven episodes, we really build towards the reveals that we get in the eighth, in the finale. We had four or five different things happen, which ended up making season one worthwhile to me personally in the end. First, in the finale, we see the Southlands and Orodruin. Druin? Orodruin? Orodruin? I can't remember how they pronounce it. But those two places, the Southlands and Orodruin, transform into Mordor and Mount Doom, which we get to see on screen with the eruption of Mount Doom. And this is not something I saw coming or expected or anticipated. And it was very very tight just seeing such infamous and legendary locations born before my eyes it was as moving as it needed to be and if the series frankly is able to harness that momentum that they built in the finale into season two we could be in for a real treat but that being said the magic of seeing mordor and mount doom born was not something this season came close to touching before the finale there just weren't enough moments that made you go, oh, shit. Okay, I see what you're doing. It was, it was mostly filler and buildup up until you get to these, this, this finale where there's so much that happens and you're just kind of like, holy God, wow, by the end of it. Um, but yeah, it's, look, it was a long time to wait. If you, if you watch this whole se season, it was a long time to wait to get to episode 8 for the real story to add real emotional weight. Now, if you watched Lord of the Rings, you remember when Frodo's life is saved by a special shirt made of Mithril. Mithril. Given to him by his uncle Bilbo. Remember at that one point, he meets him up in the Elflands and Bilbo's like, oh... Yeah, I left you the ring, but I've, I've, I've got this shirt for you. It's like, it's silver. It's like a coat of armor, but it's not a coat of armor. It's just a shirt made of mithril that he ends up putting on uh, underneath his little outfit. And you kind of forget about it after that scene, right? Um, but another one of the coolest moments of the Rings of Power season one was seeing this substance, mithril, come into play as it apparently, and this is a piece of it that we did not get from Lord of the Rings, Mithril has the power to heal elves and their dying world. So the elf world, their magic, everything about it is in big, big trouble as we find out. And Mithril has the power to um, undo all of that. And and Prince Durin the fourth, as it were, is trying to convince his father the third to continue mining Mithril, no matter how dangerous mining the substance may be. You have to go even deeper. It's it's even more dangerous to mine than whatever the fuck else these these dwarves are mining down there and his his father king during the third refuses to let him keep mining mithril and he throws one that he's got like this linden leaf from uh the elves that he's he's that during the fourth is showing him as an example like look mithril cured this elf leaf and king during the third throws that thing down a crevice and we see it float down down down, down, so deep, too deep, settling at the bottom where we see this Lindor leaf catch fire and we it's revealed the Balrog that Gandalf ends up fighting in the Lord of the Rings, the demon that he yells, you shall not pass at during the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, the Balrog who goes up in flames in the Rings of Power, episode eight, as if it's like coming back to life or being like activated, which obviously inevitably signals the doom of Khazad Doom. This was another moving moment, 
that was really, really worth the wait. Um, and of course, Mithril in in the Rings or uh, Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring saved Frodo's life at one point. So there's just like a lot of connection here to that original trilogy that gives it even more, the storytelling, even more substance, even more weight. Um, and this was another one of those moments from the finale where I was just like, okay, all right, I see what you're doing and I like it. And then of course we had our largest full on character reveal of the season when we discover that Hal Brand still can't get over that name, but he's the sketchy human man supposedly seen as heir to the Southlands. We find out he's supposed to be king of the Southlands, which was the first time that I was like, okay, we end up finding he is Sauron himself. And one of the funniest parts of my ride through season one was that throughout the first seven episodes, I was really torn between the stranger and Halbrand ending up evil, right? Like it was pretty clear. They were like, they kept making, they were trying to get you to lean into seeing like, oh, the stranger, I thought he was going to be a good guy. He has an overall good guy temperament, but he keeps doing stuff that makes you see there's darkness there. Like when he does the fireflies and all the fireflies die and you're just like, oh shit, is this going to end up being like Sauron or something? And look, in Lord of the Rings, in the, in, in the original trilogy, we never get like a good look at Sauron, right? He, he mostly operates as that eye wreathed in flame above that tower in Mordor. And the only real hints about his physical form we get, I think, come in the the Hobbit trilogy, where we know he's like a guy of taller stature, it seems. Like, I, I thought maybe the stranger could end up being Sauron. And... Uh, but then, because it was, it became pretty obvious, like he was more like a wizard, right? The stranger. Then I was leaning toward Halbrand being the bad guy. But the twist hit just as hard, regardless. And like seeing Mordor and Mount Doom born, seeing Sauron in the flesh was like this really powerful nostalgia bomb. And you have to imagine that Halbrand slash Thar- Sauron ends up operating as our central bad guy throughout the rest of the series. It was crazy shit. I mean it. It, this was cool because it really it it gave a lot more depth to the character of Galadriel, really, more than anybody else, and and it gives more depth to her refusal to go to Elf Heaven, as I call it, and and insists on staying behind. She insists on staying behind to fight the evil, which she ironically does end up help empowering and sort of creating, as it was warned she might when she was refusing to go to Elf Heaven, and it just shows. Like, it even furthers how cool of a character she is in Lord of the Rings, the trilo- the original trilogy as well. Um, because she operates as sort of this this really magical, mystical, elf queen type entity off in this forest that we don't really meet until I think the third movie. And she, or maybe it's the second movie, I can't remember. But um, remember at one point, like, Frodo's like, I would give you the ring if you wanted it. Like, I would offer you the ring if you wanted it. And she goes, like, she gets huge and turns into, like, this giant, white, terrifying, screaming queen. And then she refuses it, and she's like, I have passed the test, and now I can go to elf heaven, or whatever the fuck. Um, But yeah, so having her background, having her and Hal Brand's relationship unfold over the course of the first seven episodes, awkward as it may have been at some times, it really does end up paying off in episode eight, when you get the full-on reveal, like, holy shit, this Halbrand character tricked all these people into creating these rings, and now we're all in deep, deep shit. Uh, it was great. And then there's the stranger. Revealed in the final episode to be an Istar, which translates to wizard. Uh, presumably all but confirmed, I would say, to by one line, really, to be Gandalf, because... You'll remember he tells a confused Nori at one point, at the very end, in episode eight, if in doubt, always follow your nose. And Gandalf says this line almost exactly in The Fellowship of the Ring when he tells Mary in the Mines of Moria, if in doubt, Mary Adok, always follow your nose. And look, I there's... There's no getting around this. There are a lot of people who are still like on the internet and in articles and such saying like, well, the creators haven't confirmed it and they, we haven't had it confirmed yet. It's like, that is confirmation. Do you have any idea how bad it would be to have the stranger not be Gandalf after all, after having him literally repeat a Gandalf line after a series 
of Easter eggs over the course of season one of the Rings of Power, which point to him being Gandalf, that would be fucked. Be idiotic. So, again, I think that was a, suspi- a suspicion that a lot of people had, myself included, the second that the stranger landed on his comet, um, crashing in near the, the Harfoot community and striking up a relationship with Nori and Poppy. Because that was too similar, again, paralleling the, the Lord of the Rings original trilogy where it's Gandalf's arrival at Bilbo's 111th birthday party that starts this whole thing. It's Gandalf's arrival at Bilbo's doorstep in The Hobbit that starts that whole thing and which leads to this whole thing. So it just, there was too many parallels. There was too many Easter eggs. That one line alone, though, was like the, com- the confirmation for me and anybody else who doesn't want to pretend that we still don't know going into season two, that the stranger did end up being everybody's favorite wizard, Gandalf. I don't know if he's the gray at this point. He doesn't become the white until, (laughs) what is it, the two towers, I think? Um, But yeah, when it was all said and done, there was definitely enough in season one of The Rings of Power to get me excited about this series, The issue was that most of the excitement was derived from the finale itself. And I think to be successful longer term, the Rings of Power will need to learn to dole out some of those magic moments that make you go, ooh, throughout the course of the season, not just in the finales. Like, it can't just be build up. And I know I'm I'm, I'm counterintuitive to what I was saying earlier, that we live in this, like age of ultimate immediate satisfaction where everybody wants everything now when you've got to be excited on the edge of your seat and blown the fuck away all of the time or else it's not good and i'm arguing against that and i'm not saying that has to be the way it unfolds but it needs to be more so than it more balanced than it was in season one where for me almost all of the payoff of watching this season came in the final episode which is just a little bit to ask of the human here's what i'm saying if you want it to be successful On a commercial scale, you need to do what I'm saying. That's that's the only argument. I'm not saying it's not great storytelling. I'm not saying that it can't be good in its own right. But if you want it to be something that's even coming close to touching like what HBO is doing with the Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon, you're going to need to learn to dole out the moments of payoff a little bit more evenly throughout the course of a season. Now, you save your big one for the penultimate or the finale or whatever, it, which is typically the strategy that HBO goes with and so many other uh, television shows and creators in, in this year of 2023, excuse me, it's a new year now. Um, but they just didn't do that with season one of the Rings of Power. It was too much of it was too weighted toward that final episode where if you didn't get there, then I can see why you didn't like it. But if you got there, if you stuck through to the end, the payoff did exist. It was just all in the finale, and it was all done in a way that made you earn it, which I'm not saying, again, is wrong. It's just a dangerous game to play in 2023 where people are not willing to invest the kind of time that they once were into series because there are so many to pick from that you end up forgetting or not being excited enough and starting something else and then it falls to the wayside and the next thing you know it's like me with Better Call Saul where you're like five years behind and four seasons behind and you never know when you're going to get it in and that's not what they want with the Rings of Power I know this because they're spending a bajillion dollars to make the series right but truth be told for me the pacing and the chill nature of this season of season one really ended up being one of the reasons I loved it so much to, to just, you know, counter myself again here. As I've said before, in a time where we are inundated with incredible prestige TV that is just packed front to back with anxiety-inducing madness, it was nice to enjoy something that was a little more patiently paced and lacking in the nonstop depressing doom and drama that so many other shows, House of the Dragon included, forced down your throat episode after episode after episode. There was not a single miscarriage or permanently scarring birthing scene in Rings of Power Season 1, and for that, I am extremely thankful. So, on one hand, I'm saying, they gotta be able to amp it up a bit if they wanna pull in the kind of audience that I think they need to pull in to make this investment in this franchise worthwhile. But on the other hand, I'm saying, I liked this about the show. I liked that I could go into every episode not praying to God 
that I wouldn't be exposed to something that was going to give me anxiety or nightmares <laughs> for weeks. And House of the Dragon was the opposite of a fucking chill ride. It was, every episode, you were just like, holy hell, what am I watching? How many people can give a scarring birth in one season of TV? And now, with House of the Dragon, look, it ended up being a very powerful statement about womanhood, motherhood, um, and, all, and all of the like. But it just was a lot to take in. A lot to take in. Especially, you know, as I said when we were doing our House of the Dragon podcast, my w- my wife is pregnant that whole time we're watching. I'm just like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. We're, she's due February 2nd, by the way. One more month. January 2nd right now. One more month till my son will uh, will join us here on Earth. But Rings of Power ended up being something that I enjoyed because it didn't carry quite so much um, anxiety-inducing material on an episode-to-episode basis, but it was also the thing that made it less powerful, right? So it's a difficult balance to strike, but I, for one, appreciated the fact that it was a little more chill, not a single miscarriage. It's nice. And if I had to rate the first season, Rings of Power Season 1, on a scale of 1 to 10, I would give it a solid 7.5. All right, But at least a half a point of that rating is dedicated entirely to the insane visuals and massively effective special effects budget. Because the just the scenes, the scenery, the backdrops, the crazy... I mean, it was beautiful. It was beautifully done. And that was the thing that kind of carried me from episode to episode when the storyline was lacking a bit. I was like, yeah, the visuals are fucking the best that you're going to see on TV in 2022 when I was watching. Um, so how could you not be in, 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 in somewhat into it? Now, I don't know how that's going to age. It's really difficult to tell, but it was great. It did look great um, from that perspective as far as the visuals and the special effects and everything goes. So 7.5, and if Amazon can keep pouring a half a billion dollars into each season, I think they'll at least be making something that doesn't suck if that's, if that's saying anything. Also, before I head out today, I have to say... Uh, right before I got on the air to record this show, I saw that 1899, the Netflix series from the creators of Dark, was canceled after one season, which really pisses me off. Not so much because I invested the time in season one like I did, even though that does piss me off a little bit, but more so because I included it on my top 10 shows of 2022 list, um, the entire episode of which you can hear if you scroll down in our feed. It's the episode we did last week, the episode before this episode. Barrett and I discussed our top 10 favorite shows and honorable mentions and some of the misses from all of the different TV shows we watched in 2022. I was really proud of our lists and of that podcast. Now the only glaring uh, dark mark I have on my record is that I mentioned 1899 season one as one of my top shows of 2022 and now there won't even be a season two and just to give a thought really quickly look it season one was incredibly complicated and and convoluted in some ways um, it's speaking of having to wait till the final episode for payoff holy shit the beauty of it is now that we will not even really get to understand that payoff because there won't be a season two I still think it was a fun ride I'm not upset that I watched it but I obviously do not recommend that anyone else watch 1899, considering the fact that there won't be a season two and that the entirety of season one is literally a buildup so that you can maybe find out what the fuck is going on in season two, which will now never happen because Netflix pulled the plug. And my guess is that they probably, the, the executives at Netflix met with the writers of 1899, the creators of Dark, whoever the fuck is in charge over there with 1899, and they said, all right, what do you have for season two? And they laid it out for them, and they went, no, we're good. No more. And I get that. I understand it. Look, they didn't do enough with the first season. They didn't do enough. And if it was a show that they invested a half a billion into the first season, like Amazon did with Rings of Power, I think they would still be going and see if they could get some payoff. But it was not, and therefore it is gone. It is out. And uh, yeah, it's disappointing for fans of the series Dark, because this is the first thing we've seen from the creators of Dark since then. It was a Netflix show. They were given a big budget. You thought that they would be able to pull something special off. I think they tried to recreate too much of the magic that made Dark good in the same vein anyway, with all the confusion and the way, who, what, why, how, what is happening. That, that's your question for most of the series, or the, the whole first season of 1899. Most of the series Dark is what is happening? And you get, that's the payoff, is you wait to find out. 
and it worked with Dark. It didn't work with 1899, and as such, they got the boot. But yeah, if you if you listened to or are about to listen to our top 22 TV shows, I recommend 1899, and now I'm I'm de-recommending it. I'm taking it. No, I'm not taking it off the list. It stays on my list, but. I guess you could bump it off and then leave Euphoria where I put it at 2.5, and then now I only have 10 shows in my top 10 instead of 11, so there you go. Uh, every episode of OCC is available in full video on YouTube.com slash at Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. We appreciate y'all who subscribe on YouTube to support our show and who watch our show on YouTube. It means a lot. Uh, we're going to be redoing our studio over the next couple weeks. Our studio here at Bolin Media Headquarters in Austin, Texas, is going to be redone to be more YouTube-friendly. So that's something to look forward to. We're very excited about that. The, the second iteration of the Bolin Media Podcast Studio, recording studio, will be uh, coming to you soon. And of course, Barrett and I will be doing a recap and reaction podcast for every episode of The Last of Us, premiering on HBO January 15th. We're super stoked about this. Very excited for all of you who join us on that ride. For The Last of Us, HBO Max, January 15th is the premiere. January 16th is likely the day that we will drop our first podcast, barring some insane scheduling difficulties. Check out my media startup, BolinMedia.com. We're coming up on year four of the grind, which is mind blowing to me. Very excited to take things to the next level with you in 2023. Bolinmedia.com slash shop for OCC merch. We've got some White Lotus themed stuff. We've got those uh, Blossom Circle coffee mugs and t shirts that people have been loving, and uh, House of the Dragon themed stuff, and the Sopranos themed stuff as well. And as I said, some straight up OCC merch like this uh, beautiful hat to my left. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see right there on screen. Um, Bolin Media, B-O-L-E-N, media.com slash shop. And follow us on social media, TikTok at Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. We're on Twitter at Clams and Cockles, on Instagram at Oysters, Clams, Cockles. Follow Mr. Barrett Dudley, my co-host at Barrett Dudley, B-A-R-R-E-T-T Dudley, on Twitter and Instagram. Follow me at W-R-B-O-L-E-N, at W-R Bolin on Twitter and Instagram, and hit patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles to support our show. On Patreon, we provide ad-free premium episodes of our show. Uh, we did a, a, a podcast, a companion podcast for every single episode of HBO's classic crime drama, The Sopranos, available in full. The second you sign up, you'll have the entire backlog of every Patreon episode we've ever released, including every single podcast we did for The Sopranos. So if you've never watched The Sopranos or you want to rewatch The Sopranos between now and next season of House of the Dragon at some point, get on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles, and let Barrett and I enjoy it with you. Our companion podcast for The Sopranos is friendly to both first-timers and repeat viewers. Barrett, it was his first time. Me, it was probably my seventh or eighth time through The Sopranos, and uh, we had a blast. But every episode is done in a spoiler-free way where we're not giving away anything that's coming. If you've never seen the show before, you will not be disappointed. Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles, which is also where you can get all of our bonus coverage of House of the Dragon Season 1 and The White Lotus Season 2, uh, driven by hotline calls from members of our Mollusk Militia tier. We have a lot of fun on Patreon. We would love for you to come through and support the show and get even more OCC in exchange. Thank you again. Until next time, Clam Fam. You shall not pass.